All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Marcus Berry. I'm one of the professors in the Department of Classics. Welcome to our second colloquium uh, this fall. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, who has been both a friend and a mentor to me. Leslie Dean Jones is an associate professor and chair of classics at the University of Texas at Austin. Her first book, Women's Bodies in Classical Greek Science, published by Oxford University Press, has become a standard reference on the subject has been translated into multiple languages. She's the author of multiple articles and conference collections on ancient medicine, ancient philosophy, and women from Greco-Roman antiquity. She has been the president of the Society for Ancient Medicine, winner of the annual prize for best article from the Women's Classical Caucus, and was awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation to host the triennial Colloquium Hippocraticum in the first symposium in the United States. Her next book comes out from Cambridge University Press next year, entitled Historia Animalium 10, Aristotle's and Doxon, Topus and Dialectic, on Pufer to Meganeon. This evening, she will speak to us on the question, does Aristotle's thesis justify his author? Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you, and thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, one of the things Aristotle says in the analytics, his methodology is that different areas of science um, and the fields of knowledge are autonomous. They have their own methodologies, their own practices, their own um, methods, etc. But recently, a question that has exercised um, several scholars has been how, if at all, the biology underlies his ethical and political works. Generally, it's been assumed that you could read the politics without worrying about the biology at all. The answers now range from Mariska Luyanesson, who says, well, you have to have a general understanding of the biology to understand how the politics and the ethics are supposed to work. With Christopher Shields, who says you have to have a very, very good knowledge of de anima to understand the ethical works. What I'm interested in doing in this paper is asking if Aristotle knew what was in his biology, because that <laughs> is the question, especially on natural slaves, that a lot of people have. So, the bedrock of Aristotle's ideal city-state, the polis, this is not to be identified with any given polis in Greece, definitely not Athens. And the bedrock of Aristotle's ideal city-state for polis is the family or household, the oikos. And in the oikos, says Aristotle, the man is the ruler over his wife, children, and slaves by nature. He states, and this is number one on the handout, by nature, fuse, the relationship between male and female is that between the better and the worse, between the ruler and the ruled. And the same relationship must also apply to all of humanity. <coughs> Those humans who differ from others to the degree that the soul differs from the body and a human being from a beast, these are, by nature, slaves. Aristotle says this natural ascendancy emanates from the quality of the deliberative faculty, the beluticon in each group. The bouluticon is the faculty that enables one to decide correctly on the ultimate ends, not just how to get to these ends. So for instance, Xerxes could organize a very complicated campaign, put it in, or, um, into effect against Greece, but he couldn't decide, he didn't have the bouluticon to decide whether or not he should do this, whether this was a good cause of action leading to the best ultimate ends. In the politics, the difference in this faculty between the groups of the man, his wife, his children, and his slaves is simply asserted rather than argued for. This is number two on the handout. The free rules the slave, the male the female, and the man the child in a different way. The parts of the soul indeed inhere in all of them, but in different ways. For the slave completely Polos lacks the deliberative faculty, while the female has it, but in a form lacking authority, acheron, and the child has it, but in an incomplete form, ateros. 
In respect to slaves, Malcolm Schofield has commented, quote, Aristotle's views on slavery are an embarrassment to those who otherwise hold his philosophy in high regard. The embarrassment stems not just from the repugnant ideology itself, but from the fact that his views on slaves seem to contradict basic tenets of Aristotle's own biological and ethical philosophy, and that he is himself either oblivious to the incoherence or deliberately suppressing the problem. Delusional or insincere, as Schofield puts it. And in fact, Schofield argues that Aristotle's views don't rise to the level of ideology because he simply ignores evidence that he himself could put forward. Um, he doesn't try and explain it away, he just ignores it. In respect to women, the problem is not so much Aristotle's contradiction of what he says elsewhere about the male-female relationship, as the fact that there appears to be no connection between the biological explanation of the female role and the role um, Aristotle assigns her in the politics. <coughs> Marguerite de Laurio claims, I'm going to quote, the naturalness of the political subjection of women is, for Aristotle, a fact independent of the bodies of men and women. I do not think this is the case, and I also believe that there are arguments about the human species in Aristotle's biology that could underpin his belief in the category of natural slaves. This does not make his views any the less repugnant to us, nor do I want to argue that his views are not, at basis, ideological rather than empirical. But I think he should be absolved of the charges of delusion and insincerity. I will begin by explaining how Aristotle's theories about women in the biological works justify his claims about their inferiority to men in the politics, and then examine ways in which another Aristotelian biological concept could accommodate the category of natural slaves, though no such category is referred to in the biological works, which is what we should expect given the autonomy of the fields of knowledge. The slave is not a, an, an issue that comes into biological discussions. It's an issue that comes into political discussions. So first, the biological cause of a woman's deliberative faculty being acuron. I would agree with de Laurier that differences in intellect between the sexes do not depend upon, in the sense that they are not caused by, differences in anatomy or physiology. However, I would argue that the difference between men's and women's intellects stems from a woman's lesser heat, and to this extent is to be explained biologically. De Laurier acknowledges this argument, and she frames it as follows. Because the body of a woman is colder, and as a result, her blood is colder, and because blood and the heart are involved in the functions of perception, and because intellectual fun functions in people depend upon the functions of perception, so biological sexual differences do or might make a difference to rational functions and hence to political status. Her main objections to this argument are two. One, if this were the case, Aristotle would have to associate all deficiencies in intellect with the female sex, which he clearly does not because he identifies natural slaves, male as well as female, as even more intellectually deficient than free women. And two, describing the woman's deliberative faculty as lacking authority, acumen, does not mean that the faculty is defective, and it should not therefore be accounted for by a material part that is defective in the sense of incomplete, as she implies is the case with the female body. I will explain later in the paper how male slaves could end up intellectually inferior to free women. I will first explain why we do not need to look to any part of a woman's body, even her blood, to explain how her intellectual status could be seen as naturally inferior to a male's by Aristotle. According to Aristotle's biological theory, animals reproduce because this is the only way that they can participate in eternity. Lower animals have a variety of ways to affect this, but all the higher animals reproduce sexually because, according to Aristotle, nature does not like a delphic knife or a spit and 
lampstand combination. And what he means by a spit and lampstand combination is, imagine a spit that you would roast a whole lamb over a fire with. And as you turned it, there would be a guard to keep your hand from the heat. Once the animal is roasted, you take the lamb off the spit. By then it's getting dark. You turn it upside down and stick the spit in the ground. And what was the hand shield becomes the torch where you place the, the lighting fluid, the, the wood or whatever, to give you your lampstand. If she can separate parts to perform different functions, nature will. So the higher animals are separated into that which generates in another, the male, and that which generates in itself, the female. In this status quo, Aristotle admits that if a species were to be formed of one sex, that sex would have to be the female, because the male needs another sex to generate it. However, the species form proper is that of the male, and if there was no need for reproduction, it is the male that would exist. The female, says Aristotle, is deformed or stunted, pepe romanon, a case in which nature, nature has deviated from form proper, but necessarily so. Sexual reproduction is achieved by the transference of the species form, or ADOS, that is, the information about what sort of animal is to be created, from the father into the material contained in the mother. All animals are warm enough to concoct form of digestion, what they eat to build and maintain their own bodies. They can produce their own blood, their own hair, their own flesh. Males are so hot that they can make a completely new individual out of appropriate matter. So they can put the information into the menstrual fluid in a woman's body in a way that a woman herself can't. She's not hot enough to make a new individual. In many animals, including humans, the information for the new individual is transferred via the father's semen into the menstrual material in the mother's womb. This establishes an RK, a principle, containing the species information which will from that point on guide the development of the offspring. The individual will be male or female according to whether the RK is male or female. And this depends on the proportion of heat in the semen relative to the amount of menstrual material in the mother. If the father's heat is powerful enough to pass into the material unabated, the arche it establishes there will be as hot as the father's own arche, and it will direct the body to develop as a male. But the heat can be blunted by the amount of material present in the mother, and the colder arche results in the development of a female. The first body part the RK forms is the heart, and it is from there that the RK directs the development of the rest of the body. There is no anatomical difference in the hearts of male and female, because there does not need to be. They perform the same function. But the hotter male RK will direct the development of the body that it needs to generate in another, with, for example, the appropriate passages for the concoction of semen while the cooler female RK will direct the development of a body capable of generating in itself, with, for example, a womb. Aristotle explains the rather problematic scarcity of graduate, graduated hermaphrodites by explaining that things tend to change into their opposites. The difference in male and female heat is one of degree, but it effects a basic modification in species form which results in bodies with two different functions. Castration causes an approximation of the male to the female body, but the male never becomes an animal that can generate in itself. The difference, the, the difference in heat causes is not simply one of degree, it is one of complementary opposition. By the same argument, I do not think we have to go through all the steps of a colder body affecting blood, affecting perception, affecting intellect, to argue for the biological basis for a woman's inferior intellectual abilities. 
The human capacity for deliberation derives from the heat of the human species form, or ADOS. This is number three on the handout. For this reason, the bregma, the bone at the top of the skull, is the last bone to reach completion. For even after embryos have been brought into the world, this bone is soft in children. And the reason that this happens, especially in the case of humans, is that among animals, they have the most fluid and sizable brain. And the reason for this is that they have the purest heat in their heart. Their intellect shows how well it is blended, for a human is the most intelligent of animals. Aristotle places the pinnacle of the intellect in men at around 50, which is the same age he advises men to cease engendering children, to avoid offspring de defective in mind and body. A boy's reproductive life cannot begin until puberty, around the age of 14, because as regards heat, his body is like a woman's. Even then, his semen is usually infertile till the age of 21. This is the age at which women stabilize in a favorable condition for childbearing. But, Aristotle says, men continue to improve. This indicates a correspondence between the most favorable times for a man's intellectual and reproductive activities between 21 and 50. It is not that his ability to produce fertile semen is causing his intellectual abilities, or vice versa. They both develop with an increase in heat after puberty. Due to a lack of heat, both faculties are incomplete at LS in a child, although a male child will eventually develop to have the full intellect needed to be a master of his own author. Like a boy, a woman lacks heat, but unlike a boy, at 21, her development is complete, not incomplete, as Valerie states, but stunted. And so her lesser heat should lead us to expect a defect in intellect, such as that signified by the term acuron. It is not clear to me why Delario thinks lacking authority, acuron, does not signify a defective state. Independent evidence that it does so is illustrated by Aristotle's dis discussion of animals with two sets of generative organs. This is number four on the handout. A number of animals turn out in such a way as to have two sets of genitalia. It is always the case that of these redundant parts, one is serviceable, kurion, and the other unserviceable, aturon, through being constantly impaired with regards to nutriment, inasmuch as it exists contrary to nature, although it grows alongside it, just like growths. And these redundant parts derive nourishment, although they develop later and contrary to nature. If the fashioning agent is either completely master or completely mastered, Two similar sets of genitalia come into being. If it masters in one way but is mastered in another, one set is female and one is male. This shows that the term acuron does signify a defect. And this is not just a difference of sex. One set of male genitalia can be defective compared to another. They could even be defective compared to a set of female genitalia. In this passage, Acheron describes a part that is present but does not wear, at least not as well as the Kurion part. And this seems to me the meaning of the term in the politics passage. The woman's RK directs the development of an individual which, although similar in many ways as regards intellect, just as she is similar in many ways as regards anatomy to a man, is in principle the opposite of the man, just as she is his opposite in reproduction. From the instantiation of her arcane, she is destined to be, in intellect, someone suited to obeying rather than ruling, a complementary opposition as there was in the biological roles of male and female. As such, a woman's intellect cannot be described as incomplete in the way that a child's can. In both body and intellect, she is perfect insofar as she reaches the female telos, the purpose for the existence of a female, but stunted with regard to the full species form. And just as a woman's reproductive role is determined by an inability to fully concoct semen, her political role is determined by an in inability 
to deliberate over ultimate ends. Her role in the oikos requires her to make decisions and choices to ensure the overall smooth running of the household. So she has the ultimate ends of the household in her view, and she can make decisions about how to reach that. So she has a deliberative faculty in some capacity. But the oikos is for the sake of, and therefore subordinate to, the ends of the polis. And so ultimately, her decisions and choices are subject to the authority of her husband, who looks to the ultimate ends of the polis, which in turn decide the ultimate ends of the oikos. She does not have the intellectual capacity to challenge his decisions because she cannot deliberate over these ends herself. The rule of the husband over the wife, therefore, is a rule like that in the polis, one in which citizens have an equal stake in the flourishing of the polis and are free, indeed expected, to make decisions regarding their own activities as long as those decisions conform to the directives of the current rulers. Free men related under such rules should take turns in ruling and being ruled, for they tend to be on an equal footing and not to differ in any way in, in respect of their nature. This is, of course, not the case between a man and a woman. So the man is always in the position of the ruler. If each individual were himself immortal, there would be no need for progeny, and therefore little, if any, need for wife or oikos. Because there is a need for progeny, and in the case of humans, therefore, a need also for an oikos, nature, writ big, has seen to it through biological means that the modified form of the human ados, the woman, is suited to producing the one children, and looking after the other, the oikos. Aristotle does not explain the mechanism in the politics, but as we have seen, his theoretical habit is to bring to bear only the theoretical apparatus required by his topic. So basically, the degree of heat in the RK which causes the change to an opposite but complementary body, one that generates in itself rather than another, and an opposite but complementary psyche, one that obeys rather than rules, is in conformity with nature, which aims at the human male fulfilling his potential, his potential to deliberate over ultimate ends. In a sense, the man and the woman, the man and his wife, make up a single individual that is divided, wants to, to look at the ultimate ends of the policy, the other, the ultimate ends of the oikos. So now I want to look at the ethical and political justification for natural slaves. Slavery was a fact of life in the ancient world, and the fate of many conquered peoples who were previously free. There is little evidence of widespread discomfort with the institution anywhere in classical Greece, which is not to say that there wasn't any, but in fact, most of our evidence for debate over the subject. subject comes from the politics itself. Aristotle records that there were some who objected to the whole concept of slavery as unjust. However, these early abolitionists have not left any independent mark in classical literature, where slaves are ubiquitous and taken for granted. But while different groups of Greeks were frequently bitter enemies of one another, they preferred not to enslave fellow Greeks, themselves. They would sell them into slavery to other people, but they'd prefer not to have Greeks as slaves to Greeks. Plato remarks in passing that there will be slaves in his ideal state, but they will all be foreigners. Greeks were more comfortable with foreign slaves because they believed it was self-evident that they were inferior. A saying attributed to the earliest Greek philosopher, Thales, states, I am grateful to the gods for three things, that I was born human, a Greek, and a male. And Euripides has a Phigenia say, it is natural for Greeks to rule foreigners and not for foreigners to rule Greeks. They are a slave race. Greeks are free. Um, this is a Phigenia analysis of problematic character, but whether or not we're meant to agree with it, she's making the statement that Greeks would, have, would agree with. Aristotle agreed with this judgment, saying, in nature, a foreigner and a slave are the same thing. 
It has been argued by some that in the politics, Aristotle intends to deny the possibility of natural slaves by describing them as differing as much from free men as the soul does from the body, or a human, an anthropos, does from a beast. This is indeed a problematic statement, given that elsewhere, Aristotle refers to slaves as anthropoid, humans. And also in his biology, he says several times, there is only one ados of anthropos. But it is also the case that throughout the politics, he treats the category of natural slave as if it does exist. And a striking handout, striking example is number five on the handout. And so even <coughs> warfare will be by nature in some way a form of acquisition for hunting in the part of it, which one must use against both wild beasts and those of the human species who are suited by nature to be ruled but do not acquiesce, since this warfare is by nature just. References such as this can be found throughout book one of the politics, and it strikes me as very special pleading to assert that Aristotle means to argue that the category does not exist. Aristotle, then, is a man of his time as regards accepting foreigners as inferior, but this does not absolve him of the charge of delusion or insincerity. The reason it seems unethical for Aristotle to support slavery is in part that his philosophy argues that the purpose of an individual is to actualize their full potential. And slavery appears to be an institution whereby one man prevents another from achieving this. In Aristotelian philosophy, nature, uh, say nature with a capital N or capital V, equipped living things only with those body parts that they could make use of. Apart from humans, no other animal has logos or reason, so they do not need the body parts through which logos is manifest, namely hands and the organs of speech. Aristotle famously says that humans are not the most intelligent animals because they have hands. They have hands because they are the most intelligent animals. Nature has structured the human body so as to make it possible for humans to actualize, to bring to fulfillment the faculty for reason in their logos. And slaves have hands and tongues, so they must have this faculty for reason. So nature must intend for it to be actualized. <coughs> so one would think they shouldn't be slaves. Other animals are structured so as to actualize their potential in their ados. For example, all animals eat, but their digestive organs are fitted to the type of food their ados requires. Nature does not provide camels with front teeth, for instance, because they do not need them to digest their thorny, woody food. She does, however, make provision that they have a series of stomachs for this purpose. If camels were provided with front teeth, they would no more be able to use them than would a horse be able to speak if it had a human larynx. Nature does not give an animal an unnecessary part, and each animal lives the best life possible when actualizing all the potential of the parts in its ADOS. In one sense, a horse's purpose, its telos, is to be a horse, to fulfill its nature with a small n or a small phi, the nature of a horse. There is, though, for non-human animals, a superior telos, which lies outside of themselves, to fulfill nature with a capital N or a capital thesis. That is, that human males fulfill, fulfill their thesis because, according to Aristotle, they are the animal that is most catapusin, that is the most in accordance with nature and has the highest telos. So nature has structured the universe, or at least the world, to bring this fulfillment about. And we see this in hand, uh, number six on the handout. Plants exist for the sake of animals, and the other animals for the sake of humans, the domesticated both for the service and food, and of the wild animals, if not all, at least most of them, for food and other needs, so that humans might get cl clothing and tools from them. Animals that can be tamed and put to use by humans have a better life if they are domesticated than if they are not because they then partake in a higher telos, 
the human telos. By contrast, there is no telos for a male human beyond fulfilling his own ados, beyond being as fully as possible a human. There are beings higher than humans in the superlunar world, the celestial spheres, but they do not require humans for food, service, or even worship. A human's purpose does not lie outside of themselves. And yet, Aristotle describes natural slaves, who we elsewhere call humans, as tools of free men. This is number seven on the handout. Some tools are lifeless and some are living. And so, a possession is a tool that aids in living. And property is a number of tools. And the slave is a living possession. <coughs> this is where scholars find Aristotle to be insincere or delusional. In the biology, he asserts there is only one human species. He mentions the slave as part of this species in the politics. And yet in the politics, he justifies slavery by saying there is a human type which has the same telos as an animal. That is, to help a free man reach his talents. The sorts of tasks slave, slaves perform, fetching water, cooking a meal, hoeing a garden, looking after children, shopping, all require the possession of hands, and often the ability to speak and to understand complex instructions. They could not be performed by any other animal, because they require the possession of logos. Activities such as these are part of what is encompassed in being human. But these sorts of activity do not look to the ultimate ends of human life. They deal only with the immediate needs for a comfortable life. And having to perform them would prevent a free Greek man from theoretical contemplation and making decisions about how to live the best life. If humans are to live together, decisions have to be made about how they should relate to one another, what role wealth should play in a com community, etc. This requires the highest part of the logos, the bruticon faculty. It is the possession of this faculty that enables men to contemplate and to practice the science of governing. However, unlike the actualization of the human ados in the other spheres of logos, this does not require any specialized body part, such as a tongue or hands. So how can Aristotle be sure that there are men who lack this potential? His ethical justification for limiting women's telos to running the oikos is that this helps them partake in the ultimate telos of nature, bringing their husband to pursue contemplation and decisions about the best life of the promise. His biology can back this up by asserting that nature's preference for separating the better from the worse has made the female the complementary opposite of the male. Ethically, Ari Aristotle has argued that it is better for a barbaros, a foreigner, to be a slave to a free man, because this is how nature makes sure that he too can partake in some way in the best life, that he can't because he can't contemplate or make decisions about ultimate ends himself. But where in the biology is there a provision for such a creature, like Aristotle has made provision for a woman? And why, if such a creature exists, should it be identified with a foreigner? So people have, have had various ways of answering this. Um, David Depew and others argue that it's simply a question of more and more or less, which Aristotle recognizes exists in all species. Um, there are, there's a difference in height between humans. There isn't a standard height. So you can have humans that are taller and humans that are smaller. Difference in coloring, etc. And so um, the argument goes, it's simply a question of more or less Logos, more or re less reason. And those that have le the least reason, the delimiting group, are the ones that are natural slaves. But this doesn't answer the question, one, why is it that Aristotle identifies this with foreigners? And with, with reason, um, we still have that problem of how is it that 
some men, foreign men, can be less intelligent than women if women are supposed to be generally less intelligent than men. So the more and the less doesn't quite answer the question. It also doesn't answer the question of the hollows, the completely lacking the Bluticon faculty. It's not that they've got, it, Aristotle doesn't say they've got less logos. He says they're lacking a part of the logos. So I don't think the more or the less um, answers the question. Another way to answer the question has been to say that it is the climate. And it's true that Aristotle makes some references to how the um, warmth and the ease of the climate in, nature, in Asia causes Asians to be um, lazy, and how the cold of the northern re regions causes the Scythians to be less intelligent, less um, because of their cold of Asia. But if this is the case, then the ethical problem is what do you do if you enslave a child from one of these regions? Because if it's climate that causes the natural slave nature, ethically, if you start to raise somebody in the Greek climate, they're like any other child, presumably, at LS in the Bouloudicon faculty, and can come to be full functioning male members of the species, making decisions about ultimate ends. Um, Pierre Pellegrin tries to get around this problem by looking at lineage slavery and how slaves that are become member of the family and their children are members of the same family over time grow to be accepted as part of the ethnic group. But again, that would suggest that they are not natural slaves. They're only slaves insofar as they're not living in Greece. So we have the ethical problem again of how you could bring somebody to Greece and make them a tool of a free man if they have the potential to be um, a free man themselves. So what I'm looking for is some space in the biology that would allow Aristotle to say, yes, this category can exist. It's not that we have to agree with him, but we ha I, I want to see that he isn't just forgetting his biology or trying to stop other people remembering it to defend his view on natural slavery. Unlike the Logos faculty itself, which is marked by the possession of hands and the organs of speech, even when it is present only potentially, as with children, the Bouloudicon faculty is not marked by the presence of any specific bodily organ. It is the maturing of the entire body which is its actualization. The adult male, apart from having fully de developed testicles and producing semen, differs from his wife and children in having a muscular, firmer body, a deeper voice, and more facial and bodily hair. All consequences of the development of a greater amount of heat, and all, to Aristotle's mind, inherently superior. The upper and lower parts of a bo man's body also grow more into proportion because of his extra heat. Like children, women are more dwarf-like, says Aristotle, though they too produce a seminal residue, menses, and develop a deeper voice after puberty and an increase in heat. Since a man's right to authority over animals, children, and wife ultimately rests on his greater heat made manifest in his body, it would seem likely that Aristotle would tie the foreigner's complete lack of the Bluticon faculty and his place in this continuum between children and beasts to a deficiency of heat also, although he nowhere explicitly says this in the politics or the biological works, because it's not suited to one because it's to do with blood and guts, and it's not suited to the other because it's to, to do with social institutions. And just as animals lack hands, children lack pubic hair, and women lack testicles, we might expect to see marks of the lack of heat on the bodies of natural slaves. In Athens, there would be some male slaves who lack typically male characteristics, those who had been castrated before puberty, and who would thus have high voices, soft hairless bodies, and the inability to concoct semen. But these would be in the minority. And anyway, Aristotle's argument applies to all those foreigners who were not enslaved 
and who were reproducing in their own societies just as Greeks did. Since these natural slaves are able to reproduce sexually, nature must have provided them with enough innate heat to concoct seminal residues. The physical modifications needed to allow the production of semen would naturally produce a deeper voice and an increase in hair as a consequence. So male natural slaves look like men. Yet Aristotle maintains that nature wishes to mark a difference between the bodies of free and those of slaves. This is number nine on the handout. And so nature wants to make the bodies of free and slave different from one another. The latter strong with a view to the work they have to do, the former upright and of no use with a view to such labor, but useful for a life lived in a polis. But often the very reverse comes about. Slaves have the bodies of free men and free men only the souls. Although this is abundantly clear, that if free men were born as superior in body as are the images of the gods, everybody would agree that those who failed to reach this level of excellence would rightly act as slaves to them. And if this is true of the body, it is far more just to make this distinction in the case of the soul. But it is not as easy to see the beauty of the soul as it is of the body. Well then, there are by nature some who are free and some who are slaves, it's manifest. And for these, slavery is beneficial and just. With respect to bodies, Aristotle acknowledges the difficulty of differentiating between slave and free, citing only two relevant variables. Stronger bodies for slaves, more upright bodies for free. Even then, he admits, some slaves could look like free men, presumably with upright and perhaps weaker bodies, while some free men do not, presumably more stooped, perhaps very strong. But this is not where the real difference lies. It is in the soul that the free man truly excels in comparison to the slave. The reasoning ability of the human species comes from the heat of their arcade. A viable offspring with somewhat less heat than its father results in the modified but necessary form of the species, woman. If the complete lack of the bouluticon part of the soul is to be based on a further loss of heat, it would seem to be impossible to argue for the existence of male natural slaves. Is Aristotle therefore committed to flying in the face of his biological statements to the contrary and to assert that there are two distinct human species, each containing male and female, or is there another mechanism which could explain the slave as a modification of the same species form as free men, like women are? I believe the Arist Aristotelian concept of relapse, Tom Lewis style, may be able to accommodate the category of natural slaves. In explaining the resemblance of children to their parents and more distant relatives, Aristotle uses the terminology of movements for the different layers of information contained in the arcade. The most basic information, the lowest level of movement, is animal. And this is passed over chronologically. They're passed over one after another. Once this information has been transmitted, the more specialized movements of human, including synchronously the sexual movements, because to be human is to be either male or female are passed into the matter. And finally, individual movements are passed, which decide things such as no shape and hair color. The strongest individual movements are those of the mother and father. And so children most often resemble their parents before other relatives. But parental movements bring with them movements of more distant forebears. Aristotle uses the terminology of relapse of individual movements to explain why a child might look more like a grandparent or a more distant ancestor than a parent. For example, he cites the case of a woman of Elis who had intercourse with an African. Her daughter was not black, but that daughter's son was. His individual movements had relapsed from those of his mother into those of his maternal grandfather. Sometimes the movements can relapse so far that the individuating movements are obliterated altogether. This is number 10 on the handout. Whatever is mastered goes over into its opposite. But if it relapses, 
it goes over into the movement related to it. And if it relapses to a lesser extent, into the movement which is right next to it. But if to a greater extent, into a more distant movement. Eventually, the movements get so blurred that the individual looks like no one in its family or relatives, but only the shared movement is left, that is, being human. The result for this is that this movement is standard for all people individually. The human is generic, but Socrates the father and the mother, whoever she might be, are to be classed among individuals. Every scholar that I have read dismisses the generic human category of births, those lying between the female and truly deformed fetuses, as an empty category, which Aristotle is forced to assert by the logic of his theory. And they seem to view this as that it would look something like a Ken doll, just have all the parts right, but not look particularly individual. But Aristotle has alluded to this category in passing slightly earlier, when he <coughs> appears to be discussing empirical data, not theory. Males look like their fathers more, females their mothers. And some look like none of their relatives, but yet look like something human. And some do not look like a human in appearance, but at that point resemble a monstrosity. Indeed, an individual who does not resemble his parents is already in a way a monstrosity. For in these cases, nature has in a way deviated from the hereditary type. The first deviation is that a female is formed and not a male. Aristotle is not saying here that the human child, the human looking child, looks like someone. A child who resembles something human is not simply one that looks like a random neighbor. That can be explained biologically. And in talking about generation, Aristotle is interested only in biological relationships. It would also seem unlikely that Athenians in the fourth century had such perfect recall or documentation of ancestral appearances that a child who did not particularly look like any of its living relatives would not be assumed to take after, for example, a great grandma. The reason these offspring are considered to be monstrosities is that while they have a basic human appearance, being human properly demands individuating characteristics beyond this. If the individuating movements relapse to the point of leaving only the common human movements, all these individuals should look alike. It therefore seems possible that what Aristotle was trying to explain here were people with Down syndrome. All people with Down syndrome share a similar appearance which Aristotle may well have looked upon as a generic human type. Like women and children, they might also be described as dwarf-like and sometimes at least not upright. The milder forms of the syndrome are not necessarily immediately detectable in neonates. So we can assume that some, at least, would not be exposed and would live to reach young adulthood. The intellectual limitations of the syndrome would, therefore, have been known. Relapse of individual movements takes place after the RK has been established as either male or female. Women can resemble their paternal grandfathers, men their maternal grandmothers. And there are male and female people with Down syndrome. Aristotle is a little ambiguous over the role heat may play in the cases of relapse. This is number 12 on the handout. The reason that the movements relapse is because the forming agent is itself <coughs> affected by the thing it is forming, just as the thing which cuts is blunted by the thing being cut, and the warming agent is cooled by the thing it is warming. And generally, anything causing movement, with the exception of the prime mover, is itself moved in some reciprocal way. Heat here is cited only as a type of motivating force that is affected by performing its action. But the father semen does act as a source of movement by virtue of its heat. In the case of male generic humans, the arcade passed into the new individual is originally hot enough to produce a male. But subsequent relapses into the individual movements of more and more distant ancestors blunt the heat of the arcade eventually eradicating all individuating characteristics and leaving the resultant offspring, even when a male, with a considerably cooler arcade than normal, 
evidenced both by his generic appearance, which Aristotle alludes to, and if we accept people with Down syndrome as representative of this category, his intellectual disability, which Aristotle does not allude to in the generation because it is not relevant in a biological context. Now, I do not mean to argue that all natural slaves were people with Down syndrome. What I am arguing is the, the existence of a modification, not a subspecies of the human form, encompassing both male and female, would seem to Aristotle, which would seem to Aristotle to be completely lacking the luticon faculty, and probably in other parts of Logos as well, <coughs> would, to his mind, be empirical biological support for his explanation of why non-Greeks lacked the Bouluticon. He could see it as a mark in the body, assuming that he had, as almost every human has, some form of cross-race bias, which sees people of a different group as looking more like each other than people of your own group. If an extreme loss of individuating characteristics goes hand in hand with a severe diminution of logos, a lesser loss of individuation represented to Aristotle's eyes by a clustering around an ethnic type would imply a loss of the higher parts of logos. And I just recently came across a passage that said, a sign that humans are the most intelligent of animals, this is in Aristotle, is because they are the most polymorphous. And I've just realized that that could be a complementary argument to this, if he thinks, because humans are not as polymorphous as they don't. I mean, we all have basically the same shape, roughly the same height. Um, so I'm just wondering there if there's a complementary argument where he sees what, what he considers the most intelligent of humans, Greeks. He, if he sees greater indi individuation between them, he calls that polymorphous. I don't know, I've only just come across that passage, so I don't know where it fits in just yet. Just like women, natural slaves are a, natural, a necessary monstrosity. But if the ideal polis is to exist, and so, like females, if, if, just like women, natural slaves are a necessary monstrosity if the ideal polis is to exist. <coughs> and so, like the female form, the slave modification of the species form has always existed in nature. But while it is possible for a free man to produce a daughter or a natural slave son, one that lacked the Bluticon faculty, it is not possible for a natural slave father to produce a free child, because he does not have the necessary part in his own arche to pass over to his offspring. Foreign peoples could, therefore, never live the philosophic life in the ideal poles, however long they lived in Greece. And the best thing the free can do for them in Aristotle's eyes is to enslave them so that they might share in the truly human life. The need for women and slaves to perform their traditional tasks to make the ideal polis viable may have blinded Aristotle into believing that the reason neither group had independently formed a democracy and a philosophical tradition is because they were incapable of it. But his political theory is not based on an insincere or delusional rejection of his biological theories. His theories could support for him the impossibility for any woman or non-Greek to reach the pinnacle of perfection of a free Greek man. If confronted with his biology in an attempt to confound his category of natural slave, I think Aristotle had a way out. Do you take questions? Yeah. Yep. So, like, what about, I'm sure that slave women were raped, <laughs> but what about, like, a free man's offspring with a slave woman? Well, um, they were generally treated as slaves. Um, but theoretically, it would be possible for him, if his, you know, arcade was incredibly hot, to I think it would be possible to master the menstrual fluid of the female slave enough that he could instantiate his bruticon in the, the matter. Did they consider that? Then where, I think there are occasions where 
Greeks would adopt children by their slaves. Um, and so I think that Aristotle would explain it just as, I mean, he doesn't go into it, I'm, so I'm saying that's how I think he would explain it. It's not possible, though, for a, I don't think, for a Greek uh, slave to produce a free man with a Greek woman. And in fact, um, Aristotle does say at one point that it goes against nature for a Greek woman to marry a foreign man because um, then neither of them are living the best life. Whereas she has the ability as a woman to partake in the best life. If she marries a foreign man, she can't. So, sorry, I can't hear quite what you're saying. Um, I'm just wondering if there's all thoughts on this part at all. So, the idea that people are naturally slaves because they lack the um, lack of time to practice the process. Mm -hmm. Well, Aristotle, in fact, says that um, to live the best life, you want the best animals and the best slaves that you can get, because they will run things and work for you the best way. And he simply doesn't believe that a natural slave has the ability to deliberate about ultimate ends. But if, if it's the best slave, he's got the rest of what. As I said at the beginning, you know, Xerxes clearly has a lot of logos. Um, in some ways, Aristotle must have recognized that you know, an Athenian shoemaker couldn't have planned the invasion of Greek like Xerxes did. But to Aristotle's mind, an Athenian shoemaker has the ability, even if they are enslaved themselves by a, a foreigner, they have the ability to deliberate over what would be the ultimate end for me in, in this life, what's the best way I can live? He seems to believe that foreigners just do not have that ability. And so if you enslave them, if, if you tell them what the ultimate end is, they can work out how to get there. If somebody had worked out that, yes, Xerxes, the best thing to do is for you to be master of Greece, he could work out how to do it. But he couldn't work out of a reason if that would be the best thing to do. So the very best slave is somebody that you can say, um, you know, this, this field needs to feed 10 people. That's the ultimate end of this field. The best slave would be somebody who could then go ahead and do that. Um, Aristotle doesn't seem, he seems to be so secure in the idea that slaves themselves would say, oh, I'm partaking in the best life, that they wouldn't want to establish their own oikoi. Uh, so he, he, he does want the best slave you can possibly get. Does that answer the question? Oh, he, he doesn't have a, yeah, sorry. I'm curious, what, what did he say about that? I mean, that what, um, something? He just, it's not a discussion, an extended discussion. He just mentions that um, there are people who say slavery is bad. And he simply says he agrees with them when it's free people who have been, for instance, kidnapped by pirates or enslaved by war. But then he just goes on to say, but this doesn't apply to the natural slave. Um, and he does quote um, Philemon, I think, and somebody else as saying, um, no man is by nature a slave. So he does quote people who seem to be arguing against the category of natural slave. But we don't have a full-fledged discussion of slavery in ancient Greece. 
So it's difficult to know how many people were, were against the idea of natural slavery. Probably time for one more question. So, um, so Aristotle says that um, like slaves and foreigners still have like the same um, ethos, like the same form for like the um, realization of the matter, like a high level form uh, But is it possible that he like would have thought that you could have had like a like a subsection of like the realization of the matter, like a different form that would make um, like slaves a, like a little bit different? Like so, they would still be part of like the species of human, but it would be like a almost like a, an inferior subsection because of like a difference in like the realization of the form in the matter that makes them human. Um, it is in a sense that's what I'm saying, but um, biologically, natural slaves have always existed. It's not that they were at some point an offspring of people that weren't natural slaves. So nature, with a capital N, has always seen to it that there are natural slaves in the world. What I'm arguing is that within the natural world, Aristotle saw a process within non-natural slaves, within Greece, where the offspring could seem to lose both individuating characteristics and the glutecon faculty. And therefore, because that offspring came from the full ADOS of a Greek man, to him, although the natural slave has always existed, as you say, as a sort of a subspecies, he could refer to it as a modified form of the species, not as a different form. And so his reiterated claim in the biology that there is only one human species can take in the natural slave just as it can take in women because they're a modified species, not a modified species, they're a modified type of the, the same form. So it um, obviates the need to say, oh, there's this, this different type of human that sprung up completely differently because he sees it as being able to be derived from the full species form. Does that answer the question? Wonderful. Well, let's thank our speaker once again. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.